Welcome to BWB TV. My name is Lauren Berry, and with me today is Nina Dudnick, CEO of Seating Labs. Welcome, Nina. Thank you, Lauren. First question for you is um, just tell us about Seating Labs. Of course. Seating Labs is a social enterprise based here in Boston. We make sure that talented scientists, wherever they are in the world, are part of driving the discoveries that are improving life and our planet. That's so great. What was the inspiration behind Seating Labs? I'm a molecular biologist by training, and I had opportunities to work not just here in Massachusetts, but actually in East and West Africa and, uh, and in the Middle East. And it was the experience of having been a scientist, worked as a scientist in those very resource limited settings, coming back to Massachusetts and seeing the contrast and the availability of resources that we had here that could really be invested in scientists everywhere in the world and also the connections that were missing mm -hmm. between scientists here and scientists in other parts of the world that would move forward everybody's work. Great, and what were some of the roadblocks that you encountered along the way? Well, I imagine that most, if not all entrepreneurs face a couple of these. One is just trying to do something new. And you're trying to do something that's never been done before. You encounter a lot of skepticism, um, some naysaying, a lot of resistance to change, and so that's definitely something that we've had to power through. Mm -hmm. Seeding Labs fundamentally exists because there's a gap in the market. So the way that our science community functions here, the normal markets aren't working for scientists in the developing world. And so what Seeding Labs has to do is act as a bridge between academia, uh, the private sector, R&D, manufacturers, government, nonprofit. We have to build relationships with all of those sectors convince decision makers, get their buy-in, get people to work together across these sectors. So that's been an enormous endeavor. It's something we're still working to do better every single day. And then last but not least, we had to build a global supply chain on a nonprofit budget and with nonprofit infrastructure and working, importing into countries across the world with lots of different regulations, a lot of difficult logistics to figure out. Great, and how did you go from local hub to just having a global impact? It was really through the power of the network here in Massachusetts. Um, starting this company here from within the scientific sector in Massachusetts and using the relationships that we had here because people come from all over the world to do science here. Mm -hmm. And they have connections back home to wherever home is. And so we used those first and foremost to make connections to potential clients and customers around the world and to potential supporters and partners here. Uh, and it grew fairly slowly and organically for a little while. The big transformation for us came after 2014. We got um, a multi-million dollar investment from the U.S. Agency for International Development. And that helped us to more than double in scope and the ability to reach twice as many more scientists every year around the world. Great. And how did the local support of the Massachusetts biotech community just help launch Seeding Labs? We absolutely couldn't do this without the support of our partners here. We've built a community and a coalition of over 150 partners now. Like I said, academia, nonprofit, government, biotech, R&D, manufacturers, and it's their buy-in that we are leveraging. We consider ourselves force multipliers for the scientific community here to invest in their peers across the developing world. So the community here has invested over the years in the form of financial support, surplus lab equipment, and employee volunteer time and expertise. And we take that and we do three things. The first is we go out and we identify talent everywhere else in the world. So we run a massive talent search and selection process to find great emerging scientists in developing countries. We then connect them to each other and to scientists here, to the scientific community here in Massachusetts, both formally and informally. Mm -hmm. So we do that through in-person events, we do that through exchange programs, virtual mentorships, and an online platform that lets scientists everywhere share their expertise. And then the last thing that we do is physically invest in the scientists in the developing world by leveraging surplus lab equipment from here, something that was previously thought of as a, not an asset without any value, something to be discarded. We are making new value out of that, providing it to scientists around the developing world so they can make those new connections and those new collaborations work and move forward all of their work together. Beyond supporting researchers in developing countries, what impact are you having on an institution level, a country level, and a state level? Um, well, because of all of our partners, primarily here in Massachusetts and the biotech community, we've been able to invest more than th the equivalent of $30 million worth of scientific equipment and supplies and training in scientists in 65 institutions in 34 countries around the world. And it's growing every day. 
and that does a number of things. First, about 32,000 students, undergrad students, are getting hands-on science education right now. It, they're getting to do in the lab experiments they were only reading about before. And they go on to either to be doctors, nurses, pharmacists, lab techs, teachers, researchers themselves. And so that has this multiplier effect far into the future, probably touching millions of lives. The scientists themselves that we're investing in are not only teaching these students, but they're moving research forward. And what we find is that within two years of receiving some support from Seeding Labs and our community partners here, they are moving forward new collaborations, uh, finishing research projects, getting things that were stuck to completion, publishing papers, getting new funding, which then builds the strength of the institutions that they're at into real sustainable research institutions like the ones we see here in Massachusetts. And they're also solving real problems. So they're making real progress on things like discovering uh, drug targets for everything from malaria to diabetes, new ways to provide electricity to rural populations, better food, um, ways to rem remediate the environment, all of these things that have really local impacts on their communities, on their countries, but actually also impact us as well because these are, um, you know, diseases and forces in climate change and all kinds of things that are at our doorstep as well. This is not just a developing world problem, these are global problems. Mm -hmm. And last but definitely not least, all of the folks here in Massachusetts who participate in these programs are touched also. So we have dozens and dozens of volunteers that are part of our programs every year. They get to connect the work that they do in the labs here with something bigger and more global. They get to connect literally with their peers in other parts of the world. And they get a new perspective on the work that they're doing here on what kinds of problems are out there to be solved and on the kinds of resources that we have at our disposal to do that. Great, and do you provide more than just supplies and instruments um, to you know, impact your mission? We absolutely do. Um, we are making connections between scientists um, through a lot of different means, both in person and virtually. Uh, we're providing different kinds of training. We're connecting them to resources that already exist, particularly here in Massachusetts, things like uh, reagents and access to training and uh, publishing help and all these kinds of things that make a scientific career work well. So it's really about bringing all of these resources that are here in our community together and bringing that to as wide a population globally as possible. That's great. And last question that we have for you today is, given your hard-earned success thus far, where do you see Seeding Labs in the next five to ten years? I, my vision is no less than a transformation of what it means to be a global science community. Mm -hmm. What I think we've proven over the last 10 years is that it's not a zero-sum game. Our success here in Massachusetts is gr even greater when we invest in our peers in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And so what I see is that this becomes standard operating procedure for the scientific community. Donating surplus lab equipment is part of normal day-to-day -day business to make sure it gets into second life with somebody who can use it to drive great discoveries somewhere else in the world. Connecting your scientists here to their peers wherever they are in the world to collaborate on the kinds of problems that we don't even know we're facing yet. And emerging infectious diseases, epidemics, we've seen them start in one corner of the world and they end up on our doorstep within weeks. So having our scientists here connected to their peers who are at the front lines of these emerging problems will ultimately make all of us better able to come up with the discoveries that make our lives better. That's so great. And once again, Nina, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us today. Thank you.